the topic today was communication and following up from last week on self-awareness. We build a foundation of self-awareness and understanding how we, you know, react, respond, feel, think, um, and behave in moments of difficult communication or in really enjoyable moments. Chances are we will have, you know, reduced experiences of suffering and increased moments of joy and um, connection with other people around us. And in a time when we can't escape the people around us and etc these skills can be really helpful so one for work two in our personal relationships and also in our relationship to ourselves. and so part of learning all these skills and practices is the intention of improving all those domains of our life and we want to continually remind everybody that a lot of the things we talk about are ideals or their goals or their directions that we can move to um, they're not to be you know we shouldn't expect ourselves or it's not helpful to expect ourselves or other people to embody them all the time there may be a, a center point that we can return to when we get off track and um so that's about it i think ellen is going to lead us in a little grounding practice or i'll just stop talking and let ellen talk <laughs> <laughs> um hey Stro, on the note of connection sometimes you sound choppy to me a little bit robot like is that my internet is it is that the case for anybody else? And I mean, not that we can do heaps about it, but um, just wanted to flag that if there is anything that we can do to improve it. And if we can't, then apologies to all of you and hope that you can hear enough. Yeah, so um, someone's saying it's choppy. Um, uh, maybe. People on the call. We are yeah. just going to take a short grounding practice. Uh, so wherever you are and wherever you're sitting or standing or whoever you're surrounded with, here the invitation is just to go inside for a moment. If it feels comfortable to you, the invitation is to close your eyes and just allow yourself to arrive fully in your body and into this moment on this call. You may notice sounds around you, maybe beyond the room, beyond the walls of your home. You may notice physical sensations like the chair beneath you, your feet on the floor, your arms resting somewhere on your body. And whether your eyes are opened or closed, maybe just noticing some movement of light or color. Acknowledging the thoughts and feelings that are arising for you in this moment. Acknowledging what you're feeling and perhaps even where you feel it. Should the mind wander? Just very gently bring it back into your body. Taking a few final breaths here with full awareness. So just knowing that you're breathing in when you're breathing in and knowing that you're breathing out when you're breathing out. Good. Let's take a final breath in together and out together. Mm. Wonderful. Um, okay. Thanks. You're so welcome.
Shall we perhaps just dive right into our first breakout room? Because this session is on communication and honest communication and in the spirit of mental health and well-being and frankly, sometimes just mental illness, um, I think we are all struggling and somewhere on the gamut. And if, if things are difficult today and in this context, um, it would be great to just share that a little bit. So in your breakout rooms, um, could you share or exchange just a little bit about yourself? Maybe the last time you lost your temper? And as a functional question, what would make this session for you today a good use of your time? What do you want to get out of this session? Um, so Stro will place us into our groups and I'll place those questions into the chat okay wonderful i think that works better hi we have a baby amongst us the best thank you so much for engaging in that and it's also so nice to see you so thank you for putting your videos on it makes it makes for a definitely richer experience on our end but um also you do you if that doesn't feel right so thank you for sharing all that with us and with each other. Maybe that was a little bit cathartic. Uh, before we started this call, I was sharing with Mike that one of the reasons I was so keen to do a topic on communication and mindfulness in this current COVID climate was because in my work research, I was looking at a construct called abusive supervision and workplace incivility and as i was looking at the measurement for how how we score how abusive a leader might be i thought to myself my goodness this is how i keep talking to my husband i'm gonna place the items into the chat for you later and what it made me consider was in a very mindfulness mechanisms way the importance of intention attitude and attention and how they work together. But whether we're communicating with a coworker or an employee or a supervisor or a partner or a child, I think if there isn't a moment where we can take a big step back and actually set an intention that sets the tone of the conversation, just the quality of the relationship that you're attempting to cultivate, uh, it is very difficult to not let your emotions or the environmental factors get the better of you. Does that make sense? The importance of setting the intention. Um, the other idea here is self-regulatory resources. So in our workshop last week, this came up, but everyone has a gas tank full of energy that allows us to be polite, accomplish our work tasks, eat healthy, not snap at your children or your partner. And over time, as you do more and more tasks and you know you eat a healthy smoothie for breakfast and then you eat a salad for lunch and then you eat you know something great for dinner and then at night you just eat the rest of the girl guide cookies. Those are self-regulatory resources being consumed over time. And if we don't intentionally replenish them, then it becomes very difficult to have enough of the resources to speak to the people that we love or people that we, you know, maybe you're in a busy work environment and there's many things taking your attention away from a person or you feel a lot of pressure to get something done, then we can become short with others. Um, so the point here is, what are you doing every day to intentionally replenish your regulatory resources? And if I take this back into the caveman days, you know, you would spend all day maybe um, either hunting food or gathering fruit. And then at the end of the day, everyone comes together and communes, sitting around a fire, talking, connecting, socializing, and that's replenishing. And sometimes in this world, we spend all day doing all the things, 
but then what is your replenishing time? And if it's just sitting down in front of a TV, maybe beside someone, but not even talking to them, um, or maybe you were with the children all day, so then your only real work time is at night until you just crash. This isn't actually that replenishing. So the question here is, can you picture your day? Just April 2nd, Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. And where can you carve out time, however short, to replenish? And that might be a short practice, just like we did at the beginning of this session. It may be a longer meditation. It may be a run or a walk. And if all you have is a few breaths, if all you have is one cup of coffee that you've just enjoyed tremendously sip by sip, then that might be your way to replenish. Um, and the final thing I want to share before I pass the mic on to Stro is uh, there was a study done out of Wharton that interviewed 14 different CEOs. And they were looking at when, when the external environment is volatile and uncertain, not unlike this right now, what is the, what are some like ideal leadership strategies or tactics that help in these difficult times? And uh, one of the major themes that came out was communication, to communicate clearly and often because when there's doubt, we have to talk more. And just being, you know, trapped at home, sharing tasks, unclear responsibilities, whose turn is it to cook what meal, who needs to get what meeting done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'd love to share with you Brene Brown's check-in that she does with her husband. And it is literally, how, how am I feeling? Where are my own self-regulatory resources at? How stressed out, anxious, overwhelmed, busy am I? Where am I at? Zero to 10, where 10 is like just so full of joy and let me do your homework for you. And, you know, and zero is just like, I'm, I've got nothing left to give anybody else. I can barely take care of myself. And they just do these check ins. It might be daily, it might be throughout the day, it might be once a week. But when somebody notices that they're at a two, it's just a, it's just a quick like, hey, Mark, I'm at a two. I don't, I can't help you with that. Sorry. And if I think about the number of times I could have done that recently, <laughs> then maybe things would have unfolded a little bit more differently. Um, and in our breakout rooms, I was just sharing that me preemptively telling my three-year-old, I'm about to lose my temper, like I'm about to get really angry, and how quickly she responded to that. And yet with adults, we just don't do that same sort of self-regulatory management and exchange, but it's so valuable. Okay, so could I ask that just in your own mind, you take a moment to think about the conversations that you're having today, the exchanges you anticipate just past the salt, where's the whatever, or maybe a more meaningful conversation you're going to have at work or with a family member, and set an intention. What do you want the theme of these conversations to be like? What character trait might they embody? Would you like to be more patient? Would you like to embody kindness and compassion? Would you like to practice being assertive? Think about what best serves your needs, but also the needs of others. And to do that, honoring that it takes self-regulatory resources, what is one very small way that you can replenish refill 
your own gas tank. Good, and I will now pass the mic to Mr. Michael Stroh. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on the thing about uh, the kids. Um, I can do it sometimes with my wife, but I'm way better with my kids. Uh, and I'm really maybe a little bit on the other side of the line of balance, but I'm very clear with them if I'm irritated, frustrated, annoyed, etc. I let it be known very clearly. If you do this, I'm going to do this. I'm really angry, so if you keep going, I'm going to scream or something like that. Um, and the outcome doesn't really matter, but I think for me personally, being able to acknowledge my own rising angst and irritation and just saying it out loud is really helpful. And they're gonna learn to take it however they take it. Some days they respond better than others, but I think that's been really helpful for me in my interactions with them and, and decreasing the amount of times that I have a, an interaction that I am not proud of. And it, it really does come down to the having the resources inside of me to respond in ways that are most helpful for myself and for the people around me. We talked about it last week a little bit, the name it to tame it idea and with our self-awareness. So when it comes to communication, I think we can apply it there as well. There's a lovely practice that um, is in the mindful self-compassion program, I guess you would call it. And it's just about validating our own emotional body or state in advance of the interaction. So in the mindful self-compassion course, um, they talk about just bringing yourself a moment of, of awareness acknowledgement that this situation is difficult before you go into it or as it's happening. Um, how that works for me is if I'm anxious, worried, angry, whatnot, I've been getting better at turning towards myself and just giving myself even if it's a second of, oh my God, this is, ah, um, it decreases my, in, the intensity of my unhelpful responses and it increases my ability to respond in a way that will be helpful. I uh, love these three um, ideas. So it's validate, accept, and presence here. I'm going to share my screen for a second. So validation, acceptance, and presence. The validation is the turning inward. Oh my, this is so difficult. I don't like this. I'm scared of this, etc. Acceptance is I can't change this situation to be what in my mind I'm telling myself I need it to be for me to be okay. And the presence is trying to bring ourselves into our bodies and connecting to our breath or the ground, whatever it is, so that we can have that interaction more smoothly. To turn this outward um, as a communication practice, an example might be um, I, my self-regulatory resources are low. My wife has a moment of angst and she's coming to me to look for support. So the first thing I need to do is validate the fact that she's having a hard time and she's looking for support. So it doesn't matter whether I can respond in the way she wants to or not. It's just about saying, wow, you look like you're having a hard time or wow, that sounds really difficult. So I'm just validating her, her experience. And I can also validate my own that, oh man, I don't like this either. My resources are low, how can I improve this interaction. So I might say, again, I see that you're having a hard time, accept the fact that I can't change her or manipulate the circumstances to make this discomfort go away. And I'm gonna do a little side note on acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean we put up with bad behavior or that we you know, kind of bend over and take it for the team. That's not what acceptance means to me, at least. Um, Acceptance just means acknowledging what is happening while it's happening. 
so that I can have a choice. One, I can say something. Two, I can remove myself from the situation. Or three, which is usually the my least favorite, is just kind of suck it up. And I hate to use that term, but it's like, I can't escape this right now. I have to learn to sit through it. And a, a one way that might work is my kids are freaking out. So I'm, I validate their anger, whatever the situation, I can't change it. The acceptance is, okay, I can't make them stop. I can't give them what they need. I'm going to make a decision. And my, my decision is usually I'm going to have a timeout and I literally will like run away from them and I'll go hide in a bathroom or I'll go outside or I'll get away from them. You know, if it's safe enough um, for them to be left alone, you know, and I'll just leave. So that's me using my acceptance of the situation to take action. That's I think will be most helpful. It's a little bit of a side note. So coming back to if I can't run away for a timeout, accepting the situation for what it is. And the presence is turning towards the person and giving them my attention as best as I can. So it's not, you know, duh, I'm on my phone, da, 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 da. It's not, uh, let me just continue washing the dishes. It's really just turning to them and, you know, I don't know, expressing my aware or my beingness to them that I'm there for them. And eye contact can be really helpful too. If yeah, so I just want to yeah. jump in here because I, I, it's these three squares on the screen, two yeah. out of the three of them happen internally, right? Like these are two major yeah. pillars to yeah. effective communication because so much of it happens first inside. Yeah. I think that's just so powerful. Two thirds of this slide, we're talking about internal experience before we can show up in a way that is optimal or adaptive for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to say anything else or are you good? No, that's all I have. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, and the, the, the nice thing about that too, is that they can be turned outward as well. So the validation thing is inward and it can be outward too, but I hundred percent it is best or is most ideal when it can start in, you know, with us first. And the presence thing is also really big. And um, before I stop talking, um, you know, this is another thing I, I talk about a lot, you know, listening versus hearing and how it's not about right, wrong, good, bad. It's just about being aware of what is happening and sort of increasing our capacity to for the awareness of that. Um, but there's a big difference between listening and hearing. And so Going back to here, if we can't be there for the person, you know, it is our responsibility to tell them that. And I think I get myself caught up in not using that tool to decrease the discomfort of an interaction. And that's another kind of layer to all this is just if we can't be there for the person, how do we most effectively validate them and ask ask them for what we need. So I can't do this right now. I know you need me, but now is not a good time. Can we do it later? So that that would be my last sort of tidbit of that on there. Uh, maybe just to drive the point home a bit more, this idea of a U-turn it's called, which is for, I, I hear it from Tara Brock. She's a meditation mindfulness teacher and she's a psychologist. Um, that's just the idea of turning inward before we can give other people what they need. So it's sort of just an added layer to what we spoke about before. Um, and one way that might work is if I told my son nine times that it's time to stop playing and come and have dinner on the 10th time before I scream at him or call him or whatever I choose to call him is again, just oh, coming back to myself. Whoa, this is really triggering. This is really annoying. This is super difficult. And that usually creates a better outcome. Um, one thing that just popped into my head in a workplace environment where this can be really helpful is um, perhaps in like, uh, if you have a boss or a superior or even a colleague who's like a super micromanager and that's really annoying for you, this is a good practice of turning inward and sort of just 
deeply acknowledging that of yourself before you run into the judgment and all the names and the things you may think of your boss or colleague or superior, and then using your ability to ask questions and to be curious about why they're behaving in this way they're behaving. Because often the reason people behave in ways that they do is never what we think at first, right? So our first thoughts and judgments are usually wrong about why this person is doing what they're doing. Okay, I think that's, I need to stop talking. <laughs> um, should we do, and we were going to do one more breakout practice. Ellen, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I do actually. Great. Uh, in our breakout session, um, one of the ladies asked, like, what are some good practices to ground myself? And also, what are some ways that, um, what are some practices or, you know, key points can we share to sh bring our teams more together or to connect in a way that supports psychological safety um, in this very new and virtual environment? And I actually think the U-turn is a wonderful thing to share because it's so simple and it makes it's like a nice metaphor. So as a grounding practice, uh, and whether it's with family members or work stress and work relationships, that U-turn I think makes sense. So you can describe this idea of when things get difficult on the other side to turn inward and maybe it's five breaths, three breaths, just an acknowledgement, a head nod. Um, so grounding practice one. The other thing in terms of psychological safety or social connection, um, consider inviting your team and creating some space to have a 30 minute weekly, monthly, bi-weekly check-in where you are inviting people to share some of the things that they're struggling with. And so that we're not separating work life from family life right now, because it is all one big, wonderful melting pot. Um, how can we embrace it? And I've seen some articles very recently saying that because of this nature, you're starting to see like, like you guys have, many of us have never met and you have a snapshot into my family photos, you know, or like people's cats jump in and people's babies join in, et cetera. So we're getting to see glimpses of people's home life in a way that is new and creating the intention to come together and connect in a way, not necessarily to talk about work, but just to say like, um, how are you doing? And what went well? What can we recognize people for? And having an intentional conversation around that, um, not only does it offer this U-turn analogy where we can acknowledge the things that we're struggling with together, it allows us to bring our whole selves in and learn more about each other. It in asking like, what, what is freaking you out right now? What are you worried about? That is itself a psychologically safe um, question because people, psychological safety in the literature is this idea that I can be flawed, I can talk about flaws, I can point at other people's flaws without it creating like too much discomfort. So I can be vulnerable with others. I hope that helps a little bit just in addressing those two questions. Okay, thank you. Oh, someone said it does help, thank you. That's lovely, thanks for, for saying that. The first thing I will say is, and I love this analogy is, and it's from John Kabat-Zinn, is just to sit in a posture that embodies dignity. If you can do that. Oh, and John always says, you know, if you saw somebody sitting on a park bench in a posture that embodied dignity, you would know instantly that they're not sitting in the same way that everyone else sits on a park bench. Oh, so I invite you to do that or just to be in a, in a posture, if you can, that helps you balance or center. We can, you know, again, the invitation is to close your eyes if you're okay with that.
and bring our focus or attention inward. So whether that's the air coming in and out of your mouth or nose, or the expansion and contraction of your stomach or chest, or you know, your bum in your chair or your feet on the ground or, or wherever else you can bring centered attention to. And I heard a teacher once say, there is a body, there is a body. So if you're getting distracted or having a hard time centering, you may want to say to yourself, there is a body. As silly as that sounds, it helps us let go of our thoughts and come into our body. So I'll ask that we bring to mind a situation maybe in the last week or so that we might have wanted to go differently and specifically maybe an interaction we had with somebody. And when I say, you know, we may have wanted it to go differently, I mean specifically our, the way that we responded or the way that we handled that situation. So maybe we were too loud or forceful, or maybe we were too passive and sort of recluse, or maybe we hid. And we don't want this to be a too intense of a situation. And again, I will just remind anybody, if you don't want to do this or you want to check out or just think about what you're going to have for lunch, that's totally fine too. So with this situation, just firstly, can we just acknowledge that it was difficult? Oh, that was difficult. Oh, it's okay that I didn't handle that very well. Isn't that just the human experience? Maybe if you can, bring yourself some kind words or some compassionate words that although the situation didn't go as planned and we may have some shame or guilt around it, or anger, or sadness, that that's okay too. Emotions are allowed, they're normal, and they're unavoidable. <sighs> you may want to let out a little sigh. Oh yeah, that's hard. That is difficult. I don't like that. And as we allow this to be, we open a little bit of space to then perhaps bring ourselves a sense of encouragement or comfort. Okay, this is normal. This is the human experience. 
And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us. There's nothing flawed with us. And on the contrary, we're actually capable of maybe behaving in a way that is more in line with an intention or a goal or an interaction we would be more proud of. We have the internal resources to comfort ourselves and to encourage ourselves to move in the direction that we find more in line with our values or our intentions. So we're simultaneously bringing ourselves the kindness and the forgiveness. And we're also bringing ourselves the encouragement and the perhaps the strength or the direction towards a more helpful outcome. So before we close, let's do, you know, at your own pace, we'll have three breaths where I would invite you to sigh on your exhale or just make a little bit of noise as it does release oxytocin in our bodies, which helps us feel better. So we'll just have an in-breath. Again. <sighs> I never want to open my eyes after. My computer could have crashed and I could be talking to nobody. And here we go. Well, that was a long time. Okay. I don't know how long that was, but. Does anyone have any questions or a comment or an intention they want to share or anything before we depart? Okay, awesome. So then may I suggest that we close this session um, in this way? I'll ask that everyone unmute their mic and we'll start. Um, and let's start up with Mike Stroh and just say um, the name of one person with whom you will speak to differently <laughs> after having um, participated in this or the intention to. Who knows what will actually happen in the present? And that might just be yourself. Um, in any case, uh, would you start us off, Stroh? I would. Um, I'm going to say my brother, David Stroh. Uh, my mom. The other mics are still muted, so maybe they can just say the name in their own mind. And um, that's it for me here. Stroh, do you want to say any last final words? No, uh, just thank you to everybody for coming. Um, I'm always amazed that one person would ever show up to something like this. So I think last week it was crazy to see how many people came and I know people get busy. So I'm just grateful that for everybody for coming and uh, hopefully we can continue to do this because I really enjoy it. Um, and I would say if, if anybody has specific things that they would like us to speak about or whatnot, you're free to email and just pose those questions or, you know, anything along those lines. Um, we would love this just to be an opportunity for people to connect and to learn and to navigate this madness a little more smoothly than may otherwise be done. Sounds good. Okay.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. I want to do a namaste and thank you. <laughs> Peace.